Thank you all so much. It is a tremendous honor to open this in-person PILK. I want to thank the students for their extraordinary effort in organizing it. You know, gathering so many of us in a forum that leaves us educated, inspired, renewed, and with new comrades and connections, that's enormous work. But this year, as you've just been told, students had to start from a blank slate. None of them had ever witnessed an in-person pilk. But they progressed undaunted with determination and with open minds. And in a sense, that is what we are all called upon to do with our own work. Because our reality today is not the same reality that, that we had the last time we convened at Pilk. The floods and droughts and hurricanes are closing in. In Oregon, it's wildfires and smoke and heat domes upending people's lives. And now constant stream of news announces danger, such as recent headlines that Lake Powell is drying up, the Great Salt Lake is drying up, Lake Abert's, Lake Abert in Eastern Oregon, which is our only salt lake and is a premier flyway habitat, that too is fast shrinking. Antarctica's doomsday glacier now shows gaping cracks and the doomsday clock puts us 90 seconds to midnight. We face an all out climate emergency and a global biodiversity crisis. This is also a time when democracy worldwide is under siege from Putin's ghastly ambitions that not only drive gruesome war crimes within Ukraine, but threaten freedom and liberty well beyond. So no, we can't just pick up where we left off from Pilk four years ago. We are in a changed world. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room who walks that line between realistic optimism and hopeless despair, not knowing what the future holds. What do we focus on? Democracy or environment? World peace or ecological peace? Well, we really need not choose, for one does not exist without the other, and we must have both for survival and prosperity. And so in the coming hour, I urge us to think of environmental protection as hinged to democratic expectations. We will explore the public trust principle as an inalienable ecological right, and then I will offer some beacons that I hope can guide us as we find a path forward in this coming transition. But first, let's do ask, how do we ever get to this point? Well, we might begin by acknowledging that Environmental law is not like any other area of law. Family law, criminal law, tax law, really all other types of law deal with strictly human relations. But environmental law must answer to a higher set of laws. Indigenous culture has a nearly universal principle called natural law, which you might think of as the laws of nature. As Oren Lyon explains it, the thing you have to understand about nature and natural laws, there's no mercy. There's only law. Environmental law's main purpose is to keep us in compliance with these laws of nature because there is no negotiating our way out of those. If environmental law becomes unmoored from nature's laws, society will eventually collapse. And environmental law, no matter how voluminous, will have been irrelevant. And that seems to be about where we stand right now. For the past 50 years, half century, we've defined this field by a set of statutes passed in the 1970s, including the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, NEPA, the Endangered Species Act, the Public Land Statutes, and many others. And states and local governments passed their own laws in the same model, and so did many other countries. So let's examine those for a bit. All of these legislatively enacted laws rely on agencies to carry out their mandates, agencies that exist 
within the executive branch. You can think of nature in its entirety as partitioned among all of these executive bureaucracies, spanning the federal, state, and local levels. And under these statutes, the agencies exert nearly full dominion over nature. This hulking administrative state came to pass not so much by design or forethought, but really more by happenstance. And in retrospect, it was one big experiment, and it grew enormous power that defied standard democratic constraints. Now, if you were to picture this field of law, you might imagine each statute as a very deep cavern that leads down into subterranean tunnels. There are thousands of those statutory caverns across the field of environmental law. And governmental officials and environmental advocates step into them, and many never emerge. Because <laughs> the sheer regulatory complexity, as my law students know, draws them deeper and deeper into a maze that veers further and further away from fundamental principles and from ecological reality. Let's not pretend that this environmental law has been protective. It clearly hasn't been. Agencies turned against the people decades ago, and communities all across the country are fighting their own government under these laws. Consider what these statutes have brought. Toxic pollution, nuclear waste, clear cutting, mountaintop removal, strip mining, wetlands destruction, fracking, deep sea drilling, species extinction, dried up rivers, ocean acidification, ocean dead zones, climate crisis, and almost indescribable mutilation of landscapes across this nation. We have now contamination of every food group, and the blood of 97% of us has the forever chemical PFAS, which the EPA should have banned decades ago. Now granted, there were a few early successes. The rivers stopped catching fire anymore. Lead was taken out of gasoline, smog diminished, but despite some gains, during the last half century, industries have deployed black belt capability towards every living system that is crucial to our survival. We can't even package our losses anymore in discrete metrics like water pollution levels or numbers of listed species or acres of wetlands gone. These are completely eclipsed by the metastasizing environmental syndromes that tear at the web of life itself. Even the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has pronounced that we're nearing the eve of destruction, direct quote. We are on track for planetary heating by the end of the century that is not broadly survivable. If you are not waking up in the middle of the night over this, you probably haven't put all these pieces together. Our environmental statutes affirmatively legalize all of this destruction. What explains this? Well, nearly every statute has this structure. It first declares a legislative purpose of protecting the environment. So far, so good. But then it delegates authority to an agency to issue permits or leases that allow the very damage that the statute was designed to prevent. Now, these permit provisions were never intended to swallow the statute's purposes, but that is, in fact, what happened. The overarching agency mindset is the permits are there to be granted. Every drilling project, every open pit mine, every clear cut of ancient forest goes forward under leases or permits issued by agencies under environmental law. Agencies across the country perpetrate precisely what these laws were designed to prevent. How did agency discretion come to work so viciously against the public? when so many people protect their rivers, fisheries, lands, and climate system. Well, this one word discretion kind of holds it all. The statutes give agencies in the executive branch enormous discretion, and that discretion acts as a magnet for political influence by the industries and developers, let's not forget them, who seek permits or leases under these laws. 
Industry puts relentless pressure on agencies to relax regulation, and much of the agency decision-making is, hid is hidden from the public. And so this alone causes some real systemic dysfunction. And industry captains send large campaign contributions to the president and governors, who then appoint agency heads, and they send cam campaign contributions to the legislators who fund agency budgets, and to the county commissioners and port authorities, they target virtually everyone with environmental authority. These campaign contributions literally purchase influence, and everyone knows this. After years of this pressure, an agency falls capt captive to the very industry it regulates. And at that point, government officials look at the industry as a client they must serve. Professor Oliver Hauck once wrote in the context of the Forest Service that discretion fools no one. It means the timber industry gets to cut more timber. And with money politics driving decisions, the worst damage often hits those with the least political power, which explains why toxic waste facilities are overwhelmingly cited near low-income communities and communities of color. So often, discretion leads right into environmental racism. Well, these dynamics subsumed environmental law. They induced land use officials to allow suburban sprawl. And they moved state water agencies to appropriate rivers until many ran dry. And they drove biological opinions that keep our iconic salmon near extinction. And they kept Oregon's Department of Forestry looking the other way as private timber companies ravaged our ancient forests. Environmental law delivered the climate emergency to your doorstep. Statutory law legalized all facets of the fossil fuel system, from the coal fire plants to the offshore drilling to the gas guzzling cars, all of it. As James Speth shows in his book, They Knew, administrations going back to Lyndon B. Johnson were repeatedly warned that climate disruption would start spinning out of control around just this time, our time. These disasters you read about every day in the papers They've come all right on schedule. <laughs> you may ask, how could our leaders have knowingly put us in this peril? And it is because the fossil fuel industry holds an iron grip on American politics and has used it to steer American energy policy to serve its own ends. Nature can't take unending harm. At some point, it all adds up. You know, long ago, I wondered, with all the mounting damage I was seeing, I thought, could there ever be a time when humanity itself would be threatened? Would the job of environmental lawyers turn into something that had such grave implications that one day we would be holding the future on our shoulders in a way prior generations had not? And at that time, I remember I just couldn't quite banish that haunting possibility. And now, isn't that exactly where we stand today? And yet, the laws have not changed. So if you ask me to describe our system of environmental law, I would say it's the cane upon which humanity leans as we walk the plank towards our own destruction. We no longer have the ability to fix environmental law through incremental reform. We don't have the time. Citizen groups are running around doing their best to challenge government case by case, but they are losing the battle by not getting at the systemic forces that drive our agencies to make devastating decisions. As Ross Galbsman said, these groups are running after, running around trying to put out all these fires, but nobody's going after the pyromaniac here. Well, we lawyers tend to burrow down into specific doctrines and court rulings and regulations, and we miss the social frame through which these outcomes emerge. A social frame is something well beyond a legal doctrine. Social frames are powerful because they influence people's account of reality. Frames can oppress and subdue, or they can empower and mobilize Frames can legitimize massive ruin, or they can demand survival, protection, and recovery. The frame controlling the past 
five decades of environmental statutory law is a frame of political discretion. This frame normalizes decisions based on raw political calculation. When a statute fails to protect a community, we chalk it up to politics, don't we? This frame would benefit a monarchy or oligarchy. You can reform any law you want, in any way you want, but if it's carried out through this frame, it will justify the destruction of nature. And this is because our money-controlled politics justifies that end. When we think about the transition ahead, we urgently need a frame that transforms political discretion into sovereign obligation to the people. And we must give content to that obligation and make it enforceable within the system of checks and balances that our Constitution demands. A frame change offers a new account of what is legitimate and what is not. As George Lakoff says, reframing is changing what counts as common sense. And we had better make certain that we get our framing right and then we do so before ChatGPT starts doing it for us. Or worse, does it for those who seek to bend discretion for their own private gain. We have an operable principle in our law that presents the very antithesis of political discretion. It's called the public trust. It came twin-born with our democracy, has been recognized by our courts since the earliest days of our nation, and remains embedded in our constitutional understandings. You might well wonder why environmental advocates have not often asserted it. It's a good question. It's because over the last half, half century, they have been consumed with the morass of statutory law. The public trust declares a public property right in crucial natural resources and characterizes our government as trustee of those resources. You can imagine an ecological endowment with all the resources essential to our welfare and survival, including the waters, the wildlife, the air, the stream beds. Our ancestors drew their life from this trust, as we do. And so must our descendants. We share this trust with all of those species that fill us with wonder and awe. And we share it no less with the microbes and the worms and the bees and the plankton, the full web of life. The public trust principle requires government to sustain this ecology for us and for future generations and for all of species as the people's lasting commonwealth. The trust has roots dating back to Roman law, and it exists in many other democracies around the world as well. So it has truly global reach. You can understand why. Any government that fails to protect its natural resources condemns its people to misery and keeps them subservient. This principle makes clear that our government doesn't have the power that a monarchy or dictator would. It operates as the people's restraint on government power. As Professor Sachs said, the public trust distinguishes a society of citizens from a society of serfs. And so you won't find this principle alive in Russia or other autocracies. But the logic of democracies is this. All power accruing to government, every bit of it, derives from we, the people. And we, the people, never gave our government the power to destroy what remains essential for our survival and prosperity. So as beneficiaries of the trust, the people hold back and reserve property rights, public property rights in crucial ecology, as an enduring trust. The landmark decision in this country was Illinois Central Railroad cited back in 1892. And in that case, the Illinois legislature had conveyed the entire Chicago shoreline of Lake Michigan to a private railroad company. <laughs> Can you imagine? This was shoreline that the citizens were using for fishing and navigation and commerce. And the US Supreme Court held the grant invalid because it found a shoreline had to be held in trust for the public. It said that a grant of valuable shoreline to a railroad would be a grievance 
which could never be lawn born by a free people. And many courts since have said that the public trust is an attribute of sovereignty, part of government's very architecture that can't be destroyed except by destruction of the sovereign itself. So it's a species of constitutional law. Whatever issue you are facing, and there are a myriad of them in here, and whether you're facing it here or in other countries as well, I urge you to reframe it and think of your government officials as controlling a huge account for you. But it's not a financial account, it's our survival account, and the only one we have. Government is the designated trustee of this account. Professor Torres calls the public trust the law's DNA because it imposes a set of organic instructions on government that apply to environmental issues on any scale. These instructions are called, in the law, fiduciary obligations. And they are basic standards of care to ensure that the trustees manage the trust for the beneficiaries, the people. Statutory law still operates, but agency discretion must carry out these fiduciary duties. So in the next few minutes, I would like to explain just four of these duties, there's more, and relate them to the magnificent forests of our state. Over the last year, I've led a project that applies the trust frame to what we call the Oregon Forest Trust. And our analysis will be published in this special forthcoming edition of the Oregon Law Review that will be out in just a few months. So it will be available to all of you. The first and most basic fiduciary obligation requires government to protect our trust and not allow substantial impairment of the resources. You know, you wouldn't put your money in a bank only for that bank to intentionally deplete it, would you? Under a trust frame, protection, not destruction, must become the default mode of regulation. And this is an act of duty. Trustees can't just sit idle and permit trust assets to be destroyed on their watch. But our agencies ran that substantial impairment stop sign long ago. Massive clear cuts have wrecked entire watersheds in Oregon, decimating fish bearing streams and wildlife habitat, and all with the permission of forestry officials acting under statutes but in breach of their public fiduciary duty. Well, where the trustee allows damage, it must restore the trust. Of course, in private trust law, don't just allow the trustee to walk away after pillaging a trust. Government owes us restoration all over the place. <laughs> Second duty requires the trustees to achieve the highest and best use of public resources. This only makes sense. These are our public resources. Government should manage them for the highest public benefit, but statutes rarely ask the question of public purpose. Consider the matter of pollution. Our environmental agencies hand out free permits that allow industry to use our air and our waters as their dumping grounds. Can pollution ever be the highest and best use of these resources? Most industries have never had to revamp, even though many could, because agencies just keep reissuing their permits to pollute. This fiduciary duty calls the entire permitting system into question. And back to forests. How can clear cut? be the highest and best use of mature or old growth forests in Oregon. It just can't be. Our west side forests are some of the most carbon dense storehouses in the world. We have the Amazon forest of North America right in our backyard. So why would we destroy it or cut it on short rotation when we now face the prospect of runaway planetary heating? Society's needs have changed abruptly in this new world we need forests to sequester carbon and supply drinking water and biodiversity. Timber should be cut from young forests that need thinning. A third duty requires trustees to administer the trust for the people overall rather than for the primary purpose of benefiting a private party. Well, this makes sense. We are the beneficiaries. Yet how often has this been violated? How many terms, times have we heard port officials promote fossil fuel export facilities that would destroy fisheries and waterways and lead to massive carbon emissions in order to create a few dozen longshoremen jobs? How many times have federal agencies approved plans for cyanide heap leach gold mines on pristine public lands to benefit 
a foreign mining company. The Forest Service is poised to do just that in Idaho for two mines, putting a pig in the parlor right next to spectacular wilderness. The political discretion frame of statutory law blithely condones these decisions made for private parties over the broader public interest. And a final fiduciary duty is the duty of loyalty to the citizens and the correlative duty to avoid conflicts of interest. Courts understand that trustees have immense control over property, so in a private trust, courts will avoid decisions tainted by bias. If we applied this standard to our public trustees, we would frontally challenge the practice of accepting campaign contributions from industries that stand to benefit from environmental decisions. Everyone knows these campaign contributions cause self-interested decision-making by the people we elect to office. The problem is not that this corruption goes unrecognized, but that it has become institutionalized. Citizens just don't know of any other paradigm that would yield a higher standard of ethical behavior from their government. So enforcing a duty of loyalty could be a game changer for ecological management. Well, you can see how this trust repositions all players in their relationship to ecology. It conceives of government officials as public trustees rather than as disloyal bureaucrats. The citizens are beneficiaries with a clear public property interest in natural resources rather than as weakened political constituents with increasingly desperate appeals to beg of their public officials. And nature is an endowment holding priceless value for future generations rather than a vague environment with intangible value. You can take any environmental issue, and when you see it through this trust lens, it will shape your expectations of what you require from your government. And why is this important? Because our expectations of government form the lifeblood of democracy. The public trust is not just some claim that lawyers can assert in court cases. By far, its larger potential is changing political culture, which is always the product of the people's expectations. And as we enter a time of mind-blowing climate urgency and food and water scarcity, we need very clear expectations of how our government will manage and allocate our survival resources. But just think of the many thousands of officials who make decisions about our ecology every day. You know many of them. Most don't know these fiduciary instructions. They know only the regulations that were on their desk the first day they showed up at work. We need to educate them. There are many good people in agencies, so spark change from within wherever we can. Our U of O Environmental Law Center compiled a short primer on the public trust for people to use in dealing with government, and it's available on our website. Give it to your officials, put it in your testimony. And then my book, Nature's Trust, takes a deeper dive into all of this. So operating with a public trust expectation, how do we turn course into uncharted territory? Well, I would like to offer five beacons, I'll call them, that can guide us. And I hope this is only a start in our collective thinking because for us to just stay down in those deep statutory caverns seems to me to be an annihilative strategy for nature and people alike. And so the beacons are nature's reality, fundamental rights, moral authority, system overhaul, big vision. Well, the first and foremost must be nature's reality. We have to understand it, come to grips with it, and start making truly strategic decisions in response. When we operate in a political frame, we view outcomes as successful, just because they're hard fought and consensus was finally reached after years of polarized conflict. But political wins have nothing to do with nature's requirements. A few habitat conservation plans with wide stream buffers are not enough for our biodiversity crisis. Whatever chips were on the table decades ago They've vanished in the industry's onslaught over the last four decades. Nature's tattered systems are in collapse, and there's really nothing left to bargain away. And so solutions must come from finding new economic models, pairing environmental goals with social goals, and creating new types of jobs. The old ways of negotiating have run into a dead end. As part of nature's reality, 
Here's the hard part. We need to understand carbon math. Scientists have determined that the highest safe zone for atmospheric carbon is below 350 parts per million. And yet, here we sit with carbon dioxide levels rising over 419 parts per million. We have clearly entered a perilous danger zone. Our destiny is now governed by climate tipping points. If we spew too much more greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, the resulting temperature increase will trigger nature's own feedback loops. And those will unleash runaway heating that we can't call back. So that is why scientists constantly warn of a threshold of no return. For example, as just one example, we've already heated the planet so that the Arctic permafrost is beginning to melt. You can see the melt in, those, in that slide. And it contains vast amounts of carbon dioxide and methane. If that melt really gets going, and unlocks all those greenhouse gases, well, that's the threshold of no return. Scientists stress that greenhouse gas emissions must drop 45% by 2030, and the world must fully decarbonize by 2050. We need to keep a laser focus, because 2030 is just seven years from now. And this 45% is not some arbitrary figure. It's an emergency break to prevent us from going over climate tipping points and the climate cliff. I'm always shocked when reporters speak of these numbers as climate goals. <laughs> they sound no more binding than a runner's five minute mile goal. They certainly don't evoke any sense that humanity's survival depends on us attaining these carbon cuts. But at least finally, we have a president who speaks of these imperatives. Just six years ago, we had President Obama with all of the above energy policy, completely disconnected from any carbon math. And just four years ago, during the last pilk, Trump's insane pledge to develop $50 trillion worth of fossil fuels in this country hung over us like an indescribable pall. The fact of carbon math is we can't have fossil fuels and decarbonize too. As the UN chief said just three weeks ago, excoriating the fossil fuel industry, your core product is our core problem. We know renewables are gaining momentum beyond expectations. The more people who get behind that, the faster it will happen. This will not be linear change, but it is an all out race. To again quote the UN chief, the clock is ticking. We are in the fight of our lives, and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising. And our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a, climate, a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. So, we must keep this reality at the forefront of our minds. Either we continue to prop up the fossil fuel industry and doom humanity, or we force rapid wind down of this dangerous industry and preserve a chance for humanity. We can't have it both ways, and we can't hand this choice over to Exxon or BP or Shell by default. The choice is ours. It falls on us as the people who just happen to be alive at this consequential moment in human history. Where does that leave the practical role of fossil fuels in defending democracy against Putin's aggression? Well, the domestic renewable energy transition becomes all the more urgent to compensate for soaring emissions from Putin's war. If we couple defense strategy with climate strategy, can we develop domestic renewable energy with wartime speed? I think we must. As many of you know too, even full decarbonization of our energy system is not enough, for there's legacy carbon up in the atmosphere that has brought us well beyond the limits of 350 parts per million. All of these serial climate disasters happening now are caused not by tomorrow's emissions, but by past emissions since the Industrial Revolution. And so, as scientists make clear, we need to clean up the sky 
to restore climate balance. There's no magic vacuum cleaner yet to suck carbon out of the sky. The only present way we have is from nature's own engines of carbon sequestration. Trees and soils can sequester massive amounts of carbon. That's the good news. But we've destroyed so many of these landscapes that we've essentially gummed up these natural engines of drawdown. Techniques called natural climate solutions involve restoring these vital carbon areas, the forests, the wetlands, the tideland areas, grasslands and farmlands. And these techniques are crucial also to restoring biodiversity. And they need to be greatly scaled up and accelerated to meet the urgency we face. But instead, what have policymakers and corporate marketing agents and even some environmental groups done? They've taken these mechanisms, the only ones we have, and through what are called carbon offsets, used them to justify adding more carbon pollution to the atmosphere. In their net zero fantasy land, a company can keep polluting if it buys a forest in Indonesia or if a cattle rancher in Australia buys up and plants invasive trees. These carbon offsets were always misguided. We don't clean up a marine oil spill by telling Exxon or BP that for every oil, barrel of oil we clean up, you can dump another in the Gulf. Natural climate solutions should be used only to clean up the sky, not justify adding more carbon to the mess. If polluters want offsets, make them buy direct offsets by putting money into solar farms or wind farms. So these requirements, decarbonization, drawdown, and also biodiversity protection come to us as nature's laws. These are the non-negotiable laws. But when we look to the statutes of yesterday, we don't find anything in them geared towards solving our converging crises. We have to use every minute of these coming days strategically and match our planetary defense effort to the scale and urgency of the danger we face. As Winston Churchill said, it's not enough that we do our best. Sometimes we must do what is required. Well, my second beacon focuses on our fundamental rights and the litigation that enforces them. In this new era, we must assert not requests, but rights. And government courts play a key role in that. Recall the uh, main takeaway lesson of fifth grade civics class. Our constitutional system rests on three, not two, branches of government. And the judiciary remains crucial to holding the political branches in check and enforcing the fundamental rights of citizens. Those are not statutory rights, they're fundamental rights. In civil rights cases, prisoner abuse cases, treaty fishing cases, courts have forced delinquent officials to create plans to correct their systemic violations of the people's rights. Now, the judges don't create these plans. That's the government's job. But courts can supervise progress, and in that way, they don't overstep their role. I know in this political climate that many of you are wary of the judicial branch because of the recent appointments to the Supreme Court. But lower federal courts and state courts exist across the country. And those judges are enforcing rights every day. And it is dangerously simplistic to think that we can just cross off one entire branch of government in any strategy. And we should not look, lock our vision in the past either. For example, at this very moment, we have a Democratic president who has had 109 judicial nominees confirmed by the Senate in just his first two years of office. The pioneering litigation that brought fundamental rights to environmental law in this country was spearheaded by Our Children's Trust and its executive director, Julia Olson. I think they're here tonight. And they brought litigation on behalf of youth asserting public trust rights to a stable atmosphere. Before that, climate challenges were just statutory like seeking ESA listing of the polar bear and Clean Air Act listing of carbon dioxide as a pollutant. In Juliana versus the United States, filed on behalf of 21 youth plaintiffs in the Federal District Court of Oregon, for the first time ever, there was assembled hard evidence showing that the fossil fuel energy system of the United States was putting young people in existential danger. 
With Eugene's own Kelsey Juliana as the lead plaintiff, those youth saw a declaration of their rights and a government plan to decarbonize the, the energy system. And they had the evidence to show the government knowingly brought about this danger, and they just wanted a plan from government to pull the nation out of danger before it would be too late. They won a historic ruling in 2016 when Judge Ann Aiken declared in words that swept across the world within hours, the right to a stable climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to a free and ordered society. And that decision inspired cases in many other nations. In fact, another was filed just, week by, just last week by 12 youth in Austria. And young people have gained victories in Colombia, the Netherlands, Germany, Pakistan, France, and elsewhere. And in this country, OCT's state cases are soon going to trial in Montana and Hawaii. So check their websites for that. I view this as the leading front of environmental American law with profound importance for our survival and our democracy. But we saw in a later stage of the Juliana case that some judges will write themselves out of our constitutional democracy at the time we need them most. On a premature appeal of this Juliana case in 2020, Judge Hurwitz began the majority opinion stating that the government's fossil fuel policy was hastening an environmental apocalypse. That's a direct quote. And you would have thought, reading that, that this judge would certainly use his judicial authority to restrain government from consummating the apocalypse. But instead, he went on to say that courts can grant no conceivable remedy. He punted the matter entirely to the political branches. Can you see that this judge gives full loyalty to that political discretion frame that brought us this climate emergency? His vision of an enfeebled judiciary would represent a titanic shift in the balance of power in this country. Don't expect your fundamental rights to last if courts won't enforce them in any meaningful way. Another judge on the panel, though, Judge Staten, wrote a dissent, and she said, well, she challenged the political discretion frame in just near disbelief, and she said, government insists that it has the absolute unreviewable power to destroy this nation, and that my colleagues throw up their hands in response. She found that government instead has a clear duty to preserve the nation and that courts provide the ultimate backstop. So to her, plaintiff's request for a plan was well within the judicial tradition of civil rights litigation. And in climate cases abroad, courts have made clear that citizens' fundamental rights to survival, th those are not political questions. The Juliana case is not over by any means. It is back in Judge Aiken's court on the young people's motion for an amended complaint. And know this, while the Ninth Circuit denied a remedy, the court did not question the constitutional right that Judge Aiken announced, the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life. That right is yours. And so voice it everywhere you can. And let's not forget this. Throughout our history, judges have enforced the public trust rights of the people. You know, remember that Lodestar Illinois Central case involving the Chicago shoreline? Well, the justices back then said it would not be listened to that the control and management of the harbor of that great city a subject of concern to the whole people of the state should be placed in the hands of a private corporation. Can't you practically hear those justices saying today, it would not be listened to. The government would let fossil fuel corporations pollute our air, heat up our atmosphere, threaten our children's future, and destroy the habitability of this nation and the entire planet. It would not be listened to. A third beacon I will offer is moral authority. Moral authority resides within each of us. And when we voice it, we move an unjust world towards justice. Moral authority gathers momentum from a righteous core. It reveals stark truths that can dislodge even law and held beliefs. 
Moral outrage taps an irrepressible urge in people to do something. We see it rising all around us in calls for police reform and economic equality. Whenever we talk about climate, bring in the youth. They hold the most powerful moral authority, having done nothing to create a crisis that they will have to deal with their entire lives. Asserting moral authority doesn't have to be hard or time consuming. It can be done, in fact, best done, in everyday conversations and encounters with strangers. It can be displayed on billboards and bumper stickers and signs held by youth marching in the streets. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but tomorrow, Eugene youth are on climate strike over Northwest Natural's effort to roll back the city's residential electrification ordinance. And they've asked you to join them at 12.30 in front of the law school tomorrow for a march. <laughs> but industry lobbyists would love it instead if the public would just stay down in those deep statutory caverns because those never really galvanize moral outrage over his proposals. Those statutes use a blather of incomprehensible acronyms and techno jargon to permit deplorable destruction. So though environmental law houses a den of thieves, the public often perceives no theft. When we limit ourselves to statutory law, we focus on things like the lack of cumulative effects analysis, or improper categorical exclusions, or missed notice requirements. Yet, we have to mention those things to hang arguments on legal hooks. I totally agree. But let's not limit ourselves to the faint and muffled complaints from the bottom of those statutory caverns. One person who's not muffled is the UN chief. Here's what he recently told the world. Humanity has a choice. Cooperate or perish. It's either a climate solidarity pact or a collective suicide pact. No more bottomless greed of the fossil fuel industry and its enablers. People are rising in civil disobedience all over the world in moral outrage against fossil fuels. Scaling coal fire plants and they're blocking oil trains and protesting at DAPL. They are asserting their moral authority through peaceful civil disruption. And yes, they get arrested. In fact, they intend to. Eugene's own Civil Liberties Defense Center and Laura Regan helped gain remarkable judicial victories establishing the climate necessity defense in some of these criminal trials. This defense, yeah. I mean, many thought it couldn't be done just a few years ago. Uh, but that defense flips the focus because it asks whether the activist's peaceful disruption was justified to avert a much greater harm caused by burning fossil fuels. Now, do you see how this defense can put the fossil fuel industry on trial in the trials of these defendants? This is a legal front that criminal lawyers are taking forward, premised on the moral authority to peacefully disrupt systems that threaten human civilization as we know it. And it is the role of the broader community, those who don't risk arrest, to support them and demand the freedom that entitles their peaceful disruption. The fourth beacon leads us towards system overhaul. Remember, for the last 50 years, we've confronted environmental problems through our statutory permit systems alone. And even when a proposal is defeated, Industry throws more permit applications one right after the other, and defeating them becomes the public's game of whack-a-mole. We need to break out of that cycle. We can't solve problems with the same thinking that created them, as Albert Einstein would say. Those harmful proposals, they will just keep on coming because our industrial society invites them, and our statutory law offers no economic alternative. Environmental law never thought of a way to offer gentle living on this planet. The statutes passed a half century ago don't really connect to any economic reality, and they lack basic mechanisms to rebuild systems. I've never heard of a football team using only defense as a strategy. Games are won by moving the ball down the field to the goal. So let's apply this to environmental law. We can't just have a just say no approach without an alternative vision. As Paul Hawkins says, there's not one system that doesn't have to be remade. We need new systems 
They use renewable energy, that don't pollute our soils and air and water, that protect and restore our habitat and clean up the sky of excess carbon dioxide. And in the process of all this innovation, systems that create new jobs. Our public agencies, need, they need to stop spending our taxpayer money legalizing damage and stop wasting all of our time fighting these endless permits and turn their staff time and programs towards building a regenerative economy. Reconfiguring systems requires tools beyond mere regulation, tools like subsidies, taxes, and conservation easements. We need to throw as much money as we can to actually decarbonize society and not just regulate towards that end. And we have a robust start with the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, which authorizes $369 billion to invest in new systems for climate recovery. That is great. We now need to make sure that money is spent wisely, because you and I both know there's going to be one big money grab going on. So while statutory lawyers hold the line of defense, another league of lawyers must dive into the business of creating new systems, dealing with energy, food, transportation, housing, waste. And if those systems are, in fact, sustainable, the need for regulation retreats. These environmental lawyers will be highly transactional, making deals, finding partners, engaging other disciplines, forming vision and strategy, solidifying commitments. At University of Oregon, we are creating an opportunity framework to scale up those natural climate solutions across the Pacific Northwest. And this endeavor alone requires economists, soil scientists, land managers, conservation lawyers, and funders to co-devise solutions. And the industry that has made billions from its products but has not yet paid a dime to clean up the mess it's created should fund this sky cleanup. So we are also mapping out a litigation approach that would impose cleanup liability on these fossil fuel producers, like marine oil spill liability. Well, if I could offer an instrumental role for everybody in this room, it is this. Recruit and organize teams to converge on the challenge of remaking systems at whatever level makes sense to you. you know, you may not have the training to make batteries or re-engineer a heating system or restore a tidal estuary, but you can pull people together and empower them and initiate a common enterprise. And let me say this, every new system starts with you. We all have to envision a different way of living. Our mass consumption cannot support survival on this planet for much longer. And climate chaos is going to change our immediate lives very soon in any event. So I urge you all to do something, anything. It might be bike commuting or eating vegan or planting a neighborhood garden and expand your new system out to your full circle of influence, your friends, your family, your coworkers. I think you will find that many people are yearning to change. They just need a catalyst and that will be you. Well, the last beacon I will um, introduce is one called Big Vision. So if statutory law shoves people down into caverns, big visions lift them out. They connect and they inspire. When we fight for the environment using whatever laws we can, let us realize that our individual battle is never the end game. The threat you are fighting is part of an onslaught of similar threats all over the place. If we don't connect the innumerable battles going on to save our ecology and our communities, we forfeit that unique power and leverage that comes from calling out systemic injustice. In the Pacific Northwest, we've witnessed the power of what I would call connective action. Our region sits squarely between the vast coal and oil and gas deposits of interior America and the expanding energy markets of Asia. And several years ago, a dangerous axis of multinational corporations targeted our region to serve as its global gateway for fossil fuel exports to Asia. It pummeled Oregon and Washington with, within a couple years with 26 proposals for major export facilities, including what would have been 
North America's largest oil terminal in Vancouver, and a coal export terminal at the Lummi Nation's ancient treaty fishing site on the Salish Sea, and the Jordan Cove liquefied natural gas facility in Coos Bay, along with a pipeline that would snake across the entire state of Oregon, and 23 more proposals. And these were all approved initially by local officials, which is so often the case. Do you have any idea of the carbon bomb these would carry to the climate system and the incalculable destruction they would bring to our glorious region? If you were fighting one of those, you knew it. But then, can you also see the stunning leverage that this region holds over the ruinous ambitions of this industry by connecting all 26 proposals in one single vision? If you were fighting one of those, I'll bet you came to see that too. Sightline Institute out of Seattle ignited a regional movement when it suggested a thin green line along Cascadia beyond which none shall pass. <laughs> Suddenly, 26 isolated proposals became a united front that turned against the fossil fuel industry. Citizens across this region found the project nearest them. They connected with local organizers. They brought in friends and coworkers and neighbors, and they swarmed those projects. They wrote letters. They flooded public hearing rooms. They called in the press and took to the streets, the bridges, their kayaks to resist. This region became a front line against climate destruction. And you know, I like to tell the public, you can think of any, every one of those statutory permit schemes as setting up a different playing field of environmental law. Now stick with me here. Each law, each permit requirement, there's usually about a dozen for every big project. Each one sets up a different playing field. In the vast majority of cases, the public doesn't even show up. So industry dominates those playing fields, and those permits fall into place like a row of dominoes. But if the public comes out in strong numbers, things can go the other way. And consider this. Any large project requires about a dozen permits. The public only needs to win on one playing field, whereas the industry proponent needs to win on all. Well, this none shall pass uprising turned the tide on those playing fields, and agencies started denying permits. And it was amazing. And nearly every one of those projects died on different playing fields by different agencies using different laws, local, state, and federal. And this onslaught is not over. But the thin green line still holds today. And if this region asserts its power through connective action, those fossil fuels destined for Asia will stay in the ground. This is how to use environmental statutory law. No matter what kind of permit or process we face, connect our action to a broader and more encompassing vision and bring in people who you don't yet know. Because big visions create momentum and they embolden leaders and courts. So let's not talk about defeating just one pipeline. Let's talk about leaving fossil fuels in the ground. And let's not stop just one clear cut. While we're out, let's leave forests in the ground. And let's not talk about fish passage. Let's talk about dam de decommissioning. And while we're at it, let's talk about restoration in all its forms rewilding, land back, environmental justice, decarbonization, sky cleanup, these are among the intrepid fronts leading the transition. And to gain the clearest vision forward, we might look to those with the longest vision back, those with ancestral memory going back to time immemorial on this landscape. It is the tribes who are bringing cultural burning as an alternative to the industrial fire complex. It is the tribes who introduced gravel to gravel management of the Pacific salmon, a species that has sustained them for 10,000 years. It is the tribes who call for bringing down the dams and who do much of the hard work
to actually accomplish that. And it is the tribal elders who've seen the sacred songs at rivers beckoning those salmon's return once again to their natal waters. So as we look into the future, we can see a transition already happening across the land. As sure as a farmer somewhere is dousing Roundup across the field, there is just as surely somewhere else. A young farmer who says to her grandfather, let's try cover crops instead. And while somewhere a developer bulldozes native grassland, there is somewhere else a land trust planting habitat for migrating birds. While somewhere a well is pumping fracked gas, somewhere else a person is installing solar panels. And while the Dalles Dam still silences the roar of Salalo Falls, the Klamath Dams are coming down and the Elwha and the White Salmon now flow three, free. And it is said that tribal people who knew Salilo Falls as children still smell its mist and hear its roar. Isn't that enough for a vision? Restoration is powerful because it leads us in the right direction. After a century and a half of momentum in exactly the wrong direction, with our laws legalizing assaults against nature everywhere, finally, the minds of people all over the world are turning to a better way. The youth and children of this world have inherited unspeakable ecological threats, and there will be incalculable losses to come. But if they know that their society is turning towards recovery, if they know we are serious about giving them the best chance to survive and thrive on this planet, they will enter this severe climate transition with a resolve that is buoyed by a vision of a better future. I will close by saying that the transition ahead will be unprecedented and uncertain. Environmental law, as we define in the future, will either organize society's final assaults on nature, or it will catalyze a planetary defense of nature. It will either fuel a final tyranny, or it will breathe new life into democracy. As we think of how to reframe environmental law to serve us in the future, let us not put the responsibility or the honor of that on just those of us in this room. We must enlist everyone we can to join. Nature's laws govern everyone. We all have fundamental rights to bring. We all hear the call of moral authority that tells us what we bear on our shoulders for the future of humanity. And all of our talents are needed to rebuild the systems necessary to support life on this planet. It will take all of us in this living generation to rise to this moment. We did not live 100 years ago when people could not even imagine this climate emergency. And we will not live 100 years forward when it will be too late. In fact, if we wait even 10 years, it will be too late. This moment belongs to us, alive, right now. We can't throw it all away. Let us claim our moment by asserting not the power of life, but the trust of life. And if there are still birds in the sky and fish in the sea and trees on the land and gardens bearing food 100 years from now, our descendants will know in their hearts that we stood to claim our moment to secure this vital natural endowment for all generations to come. Thank you and have a momentous pilk.